In the intricate tapestry of medieval England, amidst the tales of kings and battles, one figure casts a long and influential shadow, Richard of York. Known not just as a noble, but as a duke with unparalleled ambition, his story is one of intrigue, power struggles, and a legacy that has echoed through the ages. Today, we delve into the life of the Duke of York, uncovering the man behind the title and the events that shaped the very course of English history. Richard of York, the third Duke of York, wasn't just any English nobleman, he was a central figure during the tumultuous Wars of the Roses. As a direct descendant of Edmund of Langley, the fourth son of King Edward III, he was deeply rooted in the powerful House of Plantagenet. Yet, his most potent claim to the English throne came through his mother, and Mortimer, who traced her lineage to Lionel of Antwerp, Edward III's second son. This placed Richard's claim above the House of Lancaster, who were descendants of John of Gaunt, Edward III's third son. Beyond his royal lineage, Richard was a man of significant influence. He held vast lands, undertook critical roles in state offices, whether it was in Ireland, France, or England. In fact, during King Henry VI's bouts of insanity, it was Richard who stepped in to govern as the Lord Protector. But it wasn't all smooth sailing for Richard. His rivalry with Henry's queen, Margaret of Anjou, and disagreements with other courtiers fueled the political chaos of 15th century England, eventually spiraling into the Wars of the Roses. Richard did make a play for the throne, and while he didn't seize it immediately, an agreement was reached, he would be the successor upon Henry's demise. Yet, fate had other plans. Just weeks after this pact, known as the Act of Accord, Richard met his end at the Battle of Wakefield. But his legacy didn't end there. His bloodline continued to shape England's history, with two of his sons, Edward IV and Richard III, eventually wearing the crown. Born on September 22, 1411, Richard of York was the offspring of Richard, Earl of Cambridge, and Aunt Mortimer. Both his parents traced their lineage back to King Edward III. While his father was the son of Edmund, the first Duke of York and the fourth son of Edward III, his mother, Aunt Mortimer, was the great-granddaughter of Lionel, Duke of Clarence, Edward's second son. This connection made Richard's claim to the throne even more potent than the reigning House of Lancaster, who descended from John of Gaunt, Edward III's third son. Richard had one sibling, a sister named Isabel. Tragedy struck early in his life. His mother, and passed away around the time of his birth, and his father was executed in 1415 for conspiring against King Henry V in the Southampton plot. The following year, another blow came when his uncle, Edward, the second Duke of York, fell in the Battle of Agincourt. This meant that young Richard, at just four years old, inherited the title and became the third Duke of York. By 1425, he also inherited the vast estates of the Mortimer family, along with their claim to the throne, after the death of his maternal uncle, Edmund Mortimer, the fifth Earl of March. With these inheritances, Richard's claim to the English throne was undeniable. He was not only the general heir of Edward III, but also directly descended from him. The vast Mortimer estates further elevated his status, making him the richest and most influential noble in England, second only to the king. To give an idea of his immense wealth, records from 1443 to 44 indicate that just from his Welsh and borderland properties, Richard had an annual income of £3,430, equivalent to about £350,000 today. After the Earl of Cambridge's demise, young Richard, now an orphan, was taken under the crown's wing. Even though his father had conspired against the king and his lineage could be seen as a threat to the House of Lancaster, Richard was permitted to inherit his family's vast estates without hindrance. These estates, combined with his title as the Duke of York, made his guardianship a prized possession. By December 1423, Ralph Neville, the first Earl of Westmoreland, had acquired it. Details of Richard's early years are sparse. As a ward of the crown, he was initially placed under the care of Robert Waterton, a loyalist to the Lancastrian cause, from 1416 to 1423. Afterward, under the guardianship of the Earl of Westmoreland, Richard was raised amidst the vast Neville clan. The Earl, having fathered twenty-two children, arranged for Richard, then thirteen, to be betrothed to his daughter, Cecily Neville, who was only nine. By 1429, the two were married. 
This union intertwined Richard with the English elite, many of whom had Neville connections. When Ralph Neville passed away in October 1425, his widow, Joan Beaufort, took over Richard's guardianship. By this time, Richard's wardship had grown in value, especially after inheriting the expansive Mortimer estates. As the years progressed, Richard became increasingly involved in the royal inner circle. In May 1426, he was knighted in Leicester by John, the Duke of Bedford and King Henry the Five-Th's younger brother. He witnessed King Henry VI's coronation in Westminster Abbey in November 1429 and even acted as the Constable of England for a duel in Smithfield in January 1430. Richard accompanied Henry VI to France and was present during his crowning as the French King in Notre Dame in 1431. By May 1432, Richard was granted full autonomy over his estates. A year later, in April 1433, he was inducted into the prestigious Order of the Garter. As Richard of York came of age, the backdrop of the Hundred Years' War in France began to shape his destiny. In 1434, he was present at a pivotal council meeting in Westminster. This gathering aimed to bridge the rift between the king's uncles, the Dukes of Bedford and Gloucester, who were at odds over the war's direction in France. The English foothold in France, established by Henry V, was precarious. England was at a crossroads, either expand its territories in France to ensure dominance or cede land to broker peace. The situation became even more complex when, after the 1435 Treaty of Arras, Burgundy no longer acknowledged the English monarch's claim to the French crown. In the wake of Bedford's death in 1436, York was chosen to lead the English forces in France. This decision was part of a series of interim measures, hoping to maintain English territories in France until King Henry VI could take direct control. However, York's authority was curtailed compared to his predecessor. Instead of the expansive powers of a regent, he was designated as the lieutenant general and governor, limiting his influence in key financial and military appointments. York's military journey began when he set foot in Hanfla, France, on June 7, 1436. This marked his inaugural military leadership role. Initially headed for Paris, the city's fall redirected him and his forces to Rouen. Collaborating with Bedford's seasoned captains, York made commendable progress. He reclaimed several territories in Normandy and instilled law and order in the region while Lord Talbot, a prominent English military leader, spearheaded most campaigns, York played a crucial role in halting the French and reclaiming territories like Fee Camp and other towns in Pays de Cox. Yet, challenges persisted. York was burdened with financing much of the military expenses from his personal coffers, leading to his growing discontent. Eager to return to England after his year-long term, he was instructed to stay until the Earl of Warwick, his successor, arrived. It wasn't until November 1437 that York returned to England. Surprisingly, despite his stature and contributions, he was not granted a seat on King Henry VI's council. In 1440, with peace talks stalling, Henry VI once again turned to Richard of York. On July 2, York was reappointed as the Lieutenant of France, this time wielding powers akin to those previously held by Bedford. York could rely on the support of Bedford's allies, including notable figures like Sir John Fastolf, Sir William Oldhall, and Sir William A. P. Thomas. To bolster his position, he was promised an annual sum of £20,000. His family accompanied him to Normandy, with his children Edward, Edmund, and Elizabeth all being born in Rouen. Upon arriving in France in 1441, York swiftly advanced towards Pontoise, which was under French siege. While he couldn't draw the French into open battle, he and Lord Talbot orchestrated a remarkable campaign, maneuvering around the Seine and Oise rivers, pushing the French nearly to Paris gates. However, despite these efforts, Pontoise fell to the French in September 1441. This marked the pinnacle and conclusion of York's military endeavors during his second term in France. The year 1442 saw York maintaining Normandy's defenses. He managed to broker a truce with Isabel, the Duchess of Burgundy, in April 1443, ensuring a ceasefire between England and Burgundy. However, financial strains began to show. 
while he received his promised £20,000 in 1,441 to 2, subsequent payments from England were delayed until February 1444. In a perplexing move in 1443, Henry VI appointed the newly minted Duke of Somerset, John Beaufort, to lead an 8,000-strong force, initially aimed at aiding Gascony. This decision diverted crucial resources from York, who was already stretched thin in Normandy. Moreover, Somerset's terms of appointment might have made York feel his authority was being undermined. The English in Normandy were vocally against this decision, but York's efforts to challenge it bore no fruit. Somerset's campaign further complicated matters, straining relations with Brittany and Alençon and undermining York's diplomatic endeavors. Somerset's campaign achieved little, and he passed away in 1444. This episode likely sowed the seeds of York's deep-seated animosity towards the Beaufort clan, a resentment that would later erupt into civil conflict. With England pivoting back to peace negotiations, York's role in France shifted to administrative and domestic duties. In a notable event in 1445, York welcomed Margaret of Anjou, Henry VI's future queen, in Pontoise. Richard of York, upon his return to England in 1445, seemed to adopt a subdued stance in the nation's politics. Despite his significant contributions, King Henry VI appeared hesitant to involve York in key decisions. Notably, York wasn't included in the inaugural royal council that marked the end of the regency in November 1437. When York's tenure in France concluded on October 20, 1445, he likely anticipated another term. However, his association with English officials in Normandy, who were critical of Henry VI's council's approach to France, might have influenced subsequent decisions. Some of these officials, like Sir William Oldhall and Sir Andrew Ogard, even accompanied him back to England. By December 24, 1446, the coveted position of lieutenant in France was awarded to Edmund Beaufort, the second Duke of Somerset. Over the next year, York was present at various council meetings and parliamentary sessions. Still, he primarily focused on managing his estates near the Welsh border. His evident disapproval of the council's decision to relinquish the French province of Maine, a move to extend the truce with France and secure a French bride for Henry, likely played a role in his July 30, 1447 appointment as the Lieutenant of Ireland. While this role aligned with his title as Earl of Ulster and his substantial Irish estates, it also conveniently distanced him from the political epicenters of England and France. The decade-long tenure essentially sidelined him from other significant roles. Though domestic affairs kept him in England until June 1449, when he finally embarked for Ireland, he was accompanied by his pregnant wife, Cecily, and a sizable army, hinting at a prolonged stay. However, citing insufficient funds to uphold English territories, York opted to return to England. His financial woes were genuine. By the mid-1440s, the crown owed him a staggering £38,666, and his estate revenues were dwindling. The 1450s were a tumultuous period in English history, marked by political unrest, revolts, and the rapid decline of English territories in France. The year 1450 itself was particularly volatile. Early in the year, Adam Mullians, the Lord Privy Seal and Bishop of Chichester, met a violent end at the hands of an angry mob. By May, William de la Pole, the Duke of Suffolk and a chief advisor to the King, was murdered during his exile. The House of Commons, reflecting the public's discontent, urged King Henry VI to revoke the generous land and monetary grants he had previously bestowed upon his favorite courtiers. By June, the counties of Kent and Sussex were in open rebellion. Under the leadership of Jack Cade, who adopted the name Mortimer to align himself with York's claim, rebels seized London. They executed James Fiennes, the Lord High Treasurer. Adding to the kingdom's woes, by August, the last English strongholds in Normandy capitulated to the French, sending a wave of refugees to England. York, sensing an opportunity amidst the chaos, landed in Anglesey on September 7th. Bypassing the king's forces, he amassed supporters during his journey and reached London by the end of the month. Despite a tense encounter with the king, York continued to rally support across the country. With London in turmoil, Somerset, 
recently returned from the disaster in Normandy, was imprisoned in the Tower of London for his safety. Publicly, York positioned himself as a champion of reform, advocating for better governance and the punishment of those responsible for the losses in France. However, his actions hinted at a more personal vendetta against Somerset. Tensions escalated in Parliament, with York and his ally, the Duke of Norfolk, leveraging the London mob to exert pressure on the Assembly. Despite these efforts, York's influence remained limited. By December, however, one of York's allies, Sir William Oldhall, was elected as the Speaker of the Parliament. In April 1451, the political landscape shifted again. Somerset was freed and given command of Calais. When one of York's supporters, Thomas Young, proposed York as the heir to the throne, he was swiftly imprisoned, and Parliament was dissolved. Henry VI, perhaps sensing the growing unrest, introduced reforms to placate the public. York, feeling marginalized, retreated to Ludlow. By 1452, York made another play for power. While he didn't aim for the throne directly, he sought recognition as Henry VI's successor, given the king's lack of heirs. He also continued his campaign against Somerset. Rallying forces from Ludlow, he marched towards London but found the city's gates closed upon the king's orders. In Dartford, outnumbered and with limited noble support, York was compelled to negotiate with Henry. While he was permitted to voice his grievances against Somerset, the aftermath saw him confined in London. After two weeks, he was paraded to St. Paul's Cathedral, where he was coerced into publicly pledging loyalty to the king. The tides of fortune ebbed and flowed for Richard of York. By the summer of 1453, it seemed he was on the wane. Henry VI, in a series of judicial tours, penalized York's tenants who had been embroiled in the Dartford incident. Queen Margaret of Anjou's pregnancy further threatened York's aspirations, as it promised a direct heir to the throne. Additionally, the union of Edmund Tudor, the newly minted Earl of Richmond, with Margaret Beaufort offered an alternative succession line. By July, York was stripped of his prestigious roles, the Lieutenant of Ireland and the Justice of the Forest south of the Trent. However, fate had a twist in store. In August 1453, a devastating blow struck the monarchy. Henry VI, possibly traumatized by the English defeat at the Battle of Castillon, a loss that marked the end of English territories in France, suffered a severe mental collapse. He became catatonic, mute, and had to be guided physically. The council, initially optimistic about a swift recovery, soon realized the gravity of the situation. By October, they convened a great council. Despite Somerset's efforts to sideline York, he couldn't exclude the realm's premier duke. Somerset's apprehensions were justified when he found himself imprisoned in the tower a month later. The political landscape shifted dramatically in March 1454. With the death of Cardinal John Kemp, the Chancellor, the government faced a constitutional crisis as the incapacitated Henry VI couldn't appoint a successor. Amidst this chaos and despite Queen Margaret's objections, York was named the Protector of the Realm and Chief Counselor on March 27, 1454. His decision to appoint his brother-in-law, Richard Neville, the Earl of Salisbury, as Chancellor was a strategic move. The political landscape was further complicated by various noble family feuds, notably the long-standing Percy Neville rivalry. Henry VI's efforts in 1453 to quell these disputes inadvertently aligned him with the Percy faction. This alignment pushed the Nevilles closer to York, granting him, for the first time, substantial support among the nobility. The mid-1450s marked a significant turning point in the political dynamics of England. Historian Robin Story pointedly remarked, if Henry's insanity was a tragedy, his recovery was a national disaster. When Henry VI regained his faculties in January 1455, after nearly a year and a half of incapacitation, he promptly undid many of York's decisions. The Duke of Somerset, previously imprisoned, was not only released but also reinstated into favor. York lost his prestigious position as the captain of Calais, and the office of protector was taken from him. Salisbury stepped down as chancellor. The summoning of a great council in Leicester on May 21st posed a direct threat to York and his allies, the Nevilles. Anticipating conflict, 
York and the Navillis began mobilizing forces in the north and possibly along the Welsh border. By the time Somerset and the king realized the extent of York's preparations, it was too late for them to gather a substantial force. The stage was set for a confrontation when York moved his forces south of Leicester. On May 22nd, the First Battle of St. Albans ensued. Though the skirmish was brief and the casualties minimal, it was significant in its impact. Key Lancastrian leaders, including Somerset, the Earl of Northumberland, and Baron de Clifford, were killed. With the king now effectively his prisoner, York had regained the upper hand. However, it was crucial for York to keep Henry alive. The king's death would have meant the rule of his infant son, Edward of Westminster, under the influence of Queen Margaret of Anjou, a scenario unfavorable to York. Following the battle, a symbolic display of power took place in London. York received the crown from Henry, marking his dominance. He appointed himself as the Constable of England and named Warwick as the Captain of Calais. As the summer progressed, York effectively held the King captive. When Parliament reconvened in November, the King's absence was attributed to illness, allowing York to once again assume the role of protector. By early 1456, it seemed that King Henry had reconciled with York's influential role in governance. Both Salisbury and Warwick retained their positions in the Council. York was tasked with defending the northern border against potential threats from James II of Scotland. However, this period of relative peace was short-lived. The king, once again, fell under the sway of a dominant figure. This time, it wasn't a nobleman like Suffolk or Somerset, but Queen Margaret of Anjou. Her influence would shape the trajectory of Henry's reign for the years to come. Margaret of Anjou's ascent to power marked a shift in the political dynamics of the English court. While she stepped into the influential roles previously occupied by figures like Suffolk and Somerset, her initial influence wasn't as overarching. York, for a time, maintained a semblance of his previous stature. His lieutenancy of Ireland was renewed, and he remained an active participant in the council's meetings. However, by August 1456, the court's relocation to Coventry, nestled within the Queen's territories, signaled a change in the political winds. The Queen's perspective on York would determine his standing, and there were ample reasons for her to view him with suspicion. Firstly, York posed a direct threat to the succession of her son, the young Prince of Wales. Secondly, there were whispers about York's intentions to forge a marital alliance between his eldest son, Edward, and the ruling Burgundian dynasty. Lastly, York's association with the Nevilles placed him squarely in the midst of the volatile Percy Neville feud, a major source of unrest in the kingdom. The Nevilles' influence began to wane in this new political landscape. Salisbury's presence at the council's meetings dwindled. The death of Robert Neville, the Bishop of Durham and Salisbury's brother, further weakened their position. His successor, Lawrence Booth, was a staunch ally of Queen Margaret, solidifying her influence in religious and political spheres. The Percys, traditional rivals of the Nevilles, found renewed favor, both within the court and in the ongoing power struggles along the Scottish border. King Henry VI, in an attempt to mend the widening rifts caused by the St. Albans conflict, orchestrated the Love Day on March 25, 1458. This event was intended to publicly showcase unity and reconciliation among the feuding nobles. However, the preceding days had seen London transformed into a fortress, with lords and their retinues displaying their might. The superficial harmony of the Love Day seemed to dissipate quickly, with underlying tensions remaining unresolved. The political tension in England reached a boiling point in 1459. The summoning of a great council in Coventry was a clear indication of the escalating conflict. York, the Nevilles, and several other lords declined the summons, suspecting that the previously assembled armed forces were meant to detain them. In response, York and Salisbury began to muster forces in their respective territories. Warwick, bringing troops from Calais, rendezvoused with them at Worcester. The subsequent summoning of Parliament in Coventry, excluding York and the Nevilles, was a foreboding sign. Their absence strongly suggested that they were to be indicted for treason. In response, York and his allies mobilized their forces. However, they were scattered across different regions. 
Salisbury successfully repelled a Lancastrian attack at the Battle of Bloor Heath on September 23, 1459. Warwick managed to evade an army led by the Duke of Somerset. The two then converged their forces with York's. On October 11th, as York attempted to move southward, he was compelled to divert to Ludlow. The subsequent confrontation, known as the Battle of Ludford Bridge on October 12th, saw York face off against King Henry VI, reminiscent of their standoff at Dartford in 1452. However, the battle took an unexpected turn when Warwick's Calais troops declined to engage. This led to a hasty retreat by the rebels. York fled to Ireland, while Warwick, Salisbury, and York's son Edward sought refuge in Calais. In the aftermath, the Lancastrians captured Ludlow Castle. Inside, they found York's wife, Cecily, and their two younger sons, George and Richard. The trio was subsequently detained in Coventry, marking a significant victory for the Lancastrians and further complicating the intricate web of the Wars of the Roses. Richard of York's return to England in September 1460 marked a significant shift in the political landscape. His actions, from landing in England to his audacious claim to the throne, were those of a man confident in his royal lineage and his right to rule. The support he received in Ireland, combined with Warwick's control of Calais and the subsequent influence over southern England, bolstered York's position. However, York's dramatic entrance to Parliament in October, where he symbolically placed his hand on the empty throne, did not elicit the response he might have anticipated. The silence that met his gesture was a stark reminder that, despite his lineage and recent successes, he did not command unanimous support among the English nobility. The subsequent negotiations, which culminated in the Act of Accord, were a compromise. While York was recognized as the heir to the throne, effectively sidelining Henry VI's own son, he was not immediately crowned king. Instead, he was granted significant executive powers and the financial benefits associated with the Prince of Wales, but not the title or other associated titles. This arrangement, while granting York significant authority, also highlighted the delicate balance of power and the need for political maneuvering in the tumultuous landscape of 15th century England. York's position as Lord Protector made him, along with Warwick, the primary power in England. With King Henry VI essentially under their control, the two were the nation's de facto rulers. However, the political landscape was volatile, and the Wars of the Roses were far from over. The events of 1460 set the stage for further conflict and power struggles in the years to come. The Battle of Wakefield was a significant and brutal defeat for the Yorkists. Richard of York's death marked the end of his personal ambition to claim the English throne, but it did not mark the end of the Yorkist cause. The manner of his death, particularly the mocking display of his severed head adorned with a paper crown, was a stark symbol of the Lancastrians' disdain for his claim to the throne and a clear message to any other potential challengers. However, this brutal act, along with the deaths of Edmund, Earl of Rutland, and the Earl of Salisbury, only served to inflame the conflict further. The Wars of the Roses were characterized by such acts of brutality and revenge, with each side committing atrocities that would be avenged in subsequent battles. Following Richard of York's death, his eldest son, Edward, took up the mantle of the Yorkist claim. Edward would prove to be a formidable military leader and, within a few months, he avenged his father's death at the Battle of Toten, a significant and bloody battle that saw the Yorkists emerge victorious. Edward's successes on the battlefield eventually led to his proclamation as King Edward IV in 1461, marking the beginning of the first Yorkist reign. The legacy of Richard of York extended beyond his death. His claim to the throne, though not realized in his lifetime, was eventually fulfilled by his descendants. Two of his sons, Edward IV and Richard III, would become kings of England, and his granddaughter, Elizabeth of York, would marry Henry VII, uniting the warring houses of York and Lancaster and establishing the Tudor dynasty. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. Delving into the intricate tapestry of the Wars of the Roses and the legacy of Richard of York has been a journey, and we're glad you joined us for the ride. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. Your support helps us uncover and share more tales that have shaped our world. 
And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. Before you go, the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this next video on the screen. Check it out and continue your historical adventure with us.